Well, welcome back. I'm so glad that you're deciding to join me again for our second session on Biblical Textual Criticism 101 as we take a look at how the Bible came to us in the form, how it was created, how it was transmitted, how it ultimately was translated and given to us today. Last time that we were together, we took a look at the Hebrew Testament, the Old Testament is what we call it. Again, out of respect to our Jewish cousins in faith, I often prefer the, the phrase Hebrew text, even though that's not an accurate description of it completely. And, uh, but today we're going to take a look at the Greek text, the Greek Testament, its creation and transmission. We hope it's a good time for you today. We hope you enjoyed it last week. So compared to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Testament, we have a better understanding of how we got the Greek Testament and its twists and turns, and, but not completely. Some of that history is lost. Some of it just, it happens, and nobody thinks of writing a book and passing it on. It would have been nice if back in 300 AD, some people had written some notes and said, well, this is what happened, and this is what we did, and this is how we changed things, and this is how we pass it on. That didn't happen. So we have to kind of try to piece things together nevertheless. But Western culture participated in the passing on of the Greek Testament that we have today. And so we do have some understanding of it. But make no mistake, there's a great deal of debate about authorship. Some of those things are not actually finalized. We're going to see that when we come to, say, for instance, the book of Revelation. Well, John wrote it. John who? Which John? Do you know it never tells us whether it was uh, John the Apostle or John the Lesser? And there are some people uh, who believe that it was some of the ancient Christians who did not believe that it was the John of the Gospel of John who wrote the book of Revelation. They believe it was the other John. These are people dating back to 300 A.D. And they got it on the, from the word of people who dated back to 150 A.D. I don't know. So we're not sure. There's a, a, actually a great deal of debate still about the authorship about how these books were passed on. So we do the best job that we can with the information that we have, trusting that nevertheless, God still gifts to us his word through these books. So let's, let's go straight into it. Let's look at the form of the New Testament. Well, we know that there are 27 books in, uh, in the New Testament. It includes four, four, count of four gospel accounts. Why wouldn't it include one? Well, I have a theory about that, and we'll come back to it in a minute. Book of Acts that we often associate with the Gospel of Luke. The Pauline epistles. Now, if you notice, uh, they're ordered by size. Unless, of course, you have a second book, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Well, 1st Corinthians, would, it would be, uh, 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 they would be ordered by the size of the book of 1st Corinthians. And then you have 2nd Corinthians. And then, again, we just order the Pauline books by size. Not by date, not by anything else. If you're wondering why we got the ordering of the New Testament, that's how they got ordered. Uh, the pastoral epistles follow them. The non-Pauline epistles, that's kind of the fancy name for them. And then, of course, finished with the book of Revelation. So that's the ordering of our New Testament. How do we get these books in the condition that they're in and the way that they're in? Who decided what books would be making the cut and entering into the Old Testament? I don't know if you realize there was some debate that took place. We're not privy to all of that debate, but we do know that there were some arguments about it. The first complete listing of the 27 books is found in Athanasius' Festal Letter in 367 AD. So by that point, and probably before that, the 27 books of the New Testament that we enjoy today were pretty well established. However, there was still disagreement. In fact, if you look at Coptic Christians, to this day, Coptic Christians still include 1st and 2nd Clement in the canon of their Bible. We're going to talk about that one in a minute, too. Like the Old Testament, it was a lengthy testing process that ultimately led to the acceptance of these 27 books. There were some books that almost made the cut, and some of those 27 books that people really questioned whether or not they should or should not be in the Bible. Let's look at just one example of it, the four Gospel accounts. Why in the world would the early church give us four separate accounts of the gospel? I believe it's an indication that the early church encouraged a variety of thought. Because if you notice, the Bible and the four accounts of the gospels 
don't exactly agree all the way across the board. We sometimes do what we call a harmonization of the four gospel accounts, as though it's just one continuous account. But I think that's a disrespect to the authors of the Bible who passed on the Word of God to us. They saw things from a different angle. And it was very intentional to say, well, if you look at things from this way, we want to include a gospel account for those who look at, that, look at it that way. We want to include a gospel account for folks who can see things this way. Because again, we don't always see things the exact same way. These gospel accounts should, as I said, not be harmonized. There are four different views of who Jesus is. Now, I think they all faithfully reflect Jesus the Christ, and you can find salvation in all of them. But each one speaks to a different audience. You might actually find that you read one of the gospel accounts and say, I really don't like this gospel. Well, don't read it. Aren't we blessed? We have four different gospel accounts. There might be one of them that reflects more and, and reflects more to you in your faith and you're able to get more out of it than another one. Read the one that means something to you that really transforms your life and fixate and focus on that. That's the great news about the Bible. We have such variety because of the intention that God wants to inspire us. And God knows that we're all different. You know, I, let me just share a story before I go on. A little off color, not really. It's still PG rated. Um, we have a member of the church. He's no longer living. But I remember going to visit with him and taking communion to him and so forth. And he said, you know, he said, there's a lot of the Bible I just don't get. I said, oh, that's okay. He said, but you know what I've done is what I really like are all the dirty parts of the Bible where there's a lot of sex. He says, I highlight all those and I read them all the time. <laughs> and I said, well, at least you're reading the Bible, right? So he read the Song of Solomon and a lot of those sex stories and so forth that inspired him in some ways. Fine. Do we believe that God can speak to him through those passages that, about sex? I absolutely do think God can. That's the amazing thing. There might be a passage of scripture you say, I just don't get it. Book of James. A lot of Christians get it. A lot of Christians hate it. Martin Luther hated the book of James. Hated the book of James. So what? Didn't speak to him. He called it the gospel of straw. He said there was no gospel in it. There was no nourishment in it. And he said, so he, he just didn't find it to be a useful book for him. Now, a lot of you say, well, he's wrong. No, he's not wrong. For Luther, the book of James meant nothing to him. So Luther shouldn't have read it. But the book of James might be your favorite book. Good for you. That's why God includes such a great variety. That's why four different accounts of the gospel, because God knows that each one of us are different. So let's go on. There was debate around the edges. We do know some of that. I already mentioned to you the book of 1st and 2nd Clement, that the Coptic Christians do have the book of 1st and 2nd Clement in their version of the Bible. 1st and 2nd Clement were highly esteemed books, and I, am, I encourage you to get them. I love the book of 1st Clement. It is one of my favorite books. It was found, as I said, in several of the New Testament codexes, so we know that the early Christians read it, and even though by 367 A.D. The, uh, the canon of Scripture is finalized, prior to that, it was in many of the Bibles of many of the early Christians. They read it. They esteemed it. They are considered, as they said, canonical by the early so the Coptic Christians. But then, so why not First and Second Clement, and why the book of Revelation? There was this guy named Eusebius and Dionysius who questioned the Johannian authorship. Uh, and they, some Christians believed it, and some Christians actually believed that it was a heretical gospel, had no business being in the Bible at all. Now, when I mention about Eusebius and Dionysius, let me, let me be clear about this. I mentioned to you that it didn't, it's not that they doubted that there wasn't a guy named John who wrote it. They just didn't believe that it was the same John who wrote the gospel. These guys would know. They were much closer to the time of Jesus than we are. So there was a great deal of debate about these things around the edges. The 27 books ultimately were the product of several centuries of prayer and debate by the early church. These 27 books that are in our New Testament had a strong following. 
And as I mentioned to you, they're formally canonized, even though they're, the 27 books were pretty much established before this. They were formally canonized in the Council of Hippo in 393 AD and the Council of Carthage in 397. This, of course, is, there was much more going on at the Council of Carthage. This is, of course, a representation of the Donatist debate. And if you want to look up what the Donatist debate is, you're welcome to, but that's not a part of our our uh, issue here today. There's no issue, no, no evidence that by the time of the Council of Hippo, Hippo or Carthage that there was any significant debate on what the content of the New Testament would be. It had already been pretty well established. They were just kind of affirming what had been decided over three and almost four hundred years. But make no mistake, there was plenty of debate prior to the Council of Hippo and prior to the Council of Carthage. So let's take a look at this. The transmission. So we, we have these 27 books now. How do they come to us? How do we get it today? How do we get the book that we're able to translate? Oh, this is where it gets really twisted. And this is where people get really mad, in particular the King James Version people. Remember, I've already said to you, I have a great deal of respect for the King James Version. I do not have a great deal of respect for King James onlyism because they're absolutely ignorant about the process of how the Bible came to us today. So I want you to hold on to your hats, figuratively speaking, that is, because it gets a little bit chaotic from here on out. So we have the Bible. It seems pretty evident. Just write the Bible. Remember how I told you in my very first lesson, I had a friend, very well-educated friend, who said to me, we should just read the New Testament that the early Christians read. It doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. It doesn't exist. We have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. And even there's disagreements and discrepancies between all of those copies. Now, some key King James only people say, well, you know, you should, you should, uh, you should only be translating from the Byzantine text. They act like they know what the heck they're talking about. They don't realize there is no such thing as the Byzantine text. Doesn't exist, okay? It's an academic exercise. We'll get to that in a minute, but it just proves what it is. See, here's what the King James Version of the folks do, is they'll, they'll take their King James Version out and they'll compare it to modern translations that <gasps> those evil people, look, they left out certain passages of scripture. They're evil. It's Satan, something satanic is afoot. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Let's take a look at how it came to us in the current form, and I will address that issue, trust me. As I said to you, the autographs do not exist. In other words, those books that were written by Paul, they're gone. They're dust. They're probably written on papyrus, and papyrus just disintegrates after time, no matter how carefully it is used and tr we try to pass it on, so we have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. So we don't have these copies. And the copies that we do have of, say, the Pauline epistles or the book of Matthew, the book of Mark or whatever, we have all these different copies of each one of these books and none of them agree 100%. None of them. So again, for those who are holding on to their hats and those who are King James only people and say, yeah, but the Byzantine text, there is no such thing as the Byzantine text. It doesn't exist. And those texts that are relegated or called Byzantine texts, none of them agree 100%. There's disagreements between all of them. Okay? So why is there so much discrepancy? Well, I'm convinced because of this. The first reason why there's discrepancy is because when the early Christians first received, and when you got the book of Paul to the Corinthians, and you were in Corinth, and you got the book of Paul that Paul wrote to you in Corinth, first of all, it probably ticked you off some because he was calling you out. And you looked at this and said, ah, oh, that Paul, you didn't think it was the scripture. You just thought it was a book written by a guy that you kind of liked. It was just a book by this guy named Paul. That's all. And so somebody said, you know, it's kind of a good book. We should make a copy of it. So somebody made a copy of it, and that's where trouble started to happen. Okay? The first recipients of the book, as I said to you, 
They didn't see them as scripture. The authors didn't even believe they were writing scripture. Paul didn't think he was writing the Bible. He just was writing something that he believed God inspired him to write that would be helpful. It's kind of like a contemporary Christian author today saying, I have to write a book because I feel inspired by God that God has given me something to pass on. This is why I'm doing this class today. I believe that I've been inspired by God to do this class today. But it's not the scripture. I don't believe that I'm doing something that should be scripture. I believe I'm making some mistakes in what I'm saying here over these sessions. I'm sure Paul thought the same thing. He didn't believe he was writing the Bible. Neither did the early Christians. And so they were under no obligation to pass on word for word what they received from the author. And we find that to be true. Early Christians amended these books. They added to these books. They corrected these books. They changed these books. You know, they'd run across something and say, I'm not sure I agree with that. They might scratch out that word and change it to another word. And I mean, let's face it, some of the people receiving the books were Greek speakers. They were talking about the Corinthians. Paul, that was not his primary language. That would have been his tertiary language, his third language. And they were looking at saying, oh, Paul, you don't even understand the word that's supposed to go there. And so maybe a scholar would substitute a better word for what he thought Paul was trying to indicate. And so these types of mistakes occurred in their transmission. And sometimes it was just a simple mistake. You're hearing, uh, you're, you're writing the word there, and you spell T-H-E-R-E, -E, and it should be there, T-H-E-I-R. You make a mistake. We see these types of mistakes in transmission in every single Greek text. So let's take a look very specifically at the type of mistakes of, that occurred in the transmission. As I mentioned to you, they didn't believe at first they were passing on Scripture. Once they did, they started to take a little bit more care of them. But by then we had multiple copies that existed. The one problem that we have is that the first century Greek, when Paul wrote his letter to the Corinthians, he wrote it in all capital letters, and there were no breaks between the words. There was no punctuation. Oh, I would like you to try to read something like that. So take a look at this word. What is that? God is nowhere. Actually, the... the, the um, uh, the story behind this is an atheist wrote this on a chalkboard one time. God is nowhere in all capital letters. But then a little five-year-old girl came out and broke this apart and said, God is now here. See, to see the exact same phrase can be interpreted in two different ways. God is nowhere. God is now here. So this is a problem that occurred oftentimes when we were trying to transmit the, the Greek texts. You know, what was he really trying to say? What were the words? So that's one way. There are also accidents in copying. As I mentioned to you, there or there. You know, what, what am I saying? There or there. Oops, let me get to the right. Uh, uh, that would be one example. The wrong letter. Uh, oftentimes, scholars would sit there and they'd, they'd read it. So if you're writing it, you're one of the copyists, and you're hearing it, uh, and you're writing it down, you might hear the wrong word. It sounds exactly the same, it's spelled differently, but now you've got a difference that occurs in the text. Um, confusing or similar words, whale or whale. <laughs> uh, two different things. Which one am I saying? When I say whale, which one am I saying? They mean two radically different things. This we can kind of understand, but this also happens in the transmission of the Bible. And then skipping a word or a phrase. We actually have evidence of this in several copies of the Greek New Testament. Uh, I want you to take a look at, at the word. This actually happened. And some of the texts that we have, this is from John chapter 17, 15. I do not pray that you should, no, notice the should is in red. I do not pray that you should take them from the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. So some scholar at some point was reading along. I, I, do, I do not pray that you should. He, he was writing it down, looked down. The next, his eye was drawn to that next should, and he skipped this entire line. It was left out of his, his copy of the Bible. And so we actually have 
some texts, some Greek texts that say, I do not pray that you should keep from, from the evil one. Well, that doesn't even make sense. Theologically, it's completely inaccurate. But the scholar just wrote it down. He wasn't trying to change it. He wasn't trying to make a mistake. He wasn't trying to be evil or satanic. It just is something that happens because we don't have autocorrect and we can't go back and correct it. He just wrote it down and next thing you know, we've got a Greek text that has this in it. <laughs> okay? Along with some other Greek texts that are written like that. Um, I just want to show you this because this is funny. Um, this is actually one of my, my textbooks that I used it when I was uh, working on my THM. Um, you can see I, I was interacting with the author quite a bit. As I mentioned to you, the early Christians, some of them probably didn't even believe that they were reading the scripture because the early authors didn't believe they were passing on the scripture. And so the first scholars would also start writing in the, in the corners here. And, you know, but again, remember, they were writing their, their, their stuff and, and it would get passed on. Maybe, they, maybe uh, the next person grabbed a hold of this book and said, well, you know, this column in the column, maybe he realized that the scholar before him made a mistake, and so he was trying to tell us that this was supposed to be in there, but was left out. Because again, no autocorrect. That type of stuff happens all the time. So you can see, I disagree with this author's uh, interpretation sometimes. I disagree with the word choice that they've met. I, I put my own comments in the corners and so forth. And... Uh, I mean, it was a good book, by the way. This is, a, uh, this, this is just a fantastic book about uh, uh, the Jewish faith, but we'll go on. But those types of things happened. But then, there may have actually been some intentional changes that took place. For doctrinal clarity, that actually becomes evident. The, the newer the text becomes, the closer to us that the text becomes, the greater the differences are between the more ancient copies of the Greek. Because, again, the King James people like to talk about the Byzantine texts. The Byzantine texts seem to make more and more changes the younger they get. Because they were trying to, they saw that there were some problems in the way maybe the language was being communicated, was being misunderstood. They said, well, let me change a word a little bit here or there so that we can communicate exactly what we want to communicate, because I'm sure that would be faithful to what Paul would want. So, we see some intentional changes that took place. Again, for doctrinal clarity, concerns that certain passages were being supported for heretical doctrines like Gnosticism, Adoptionism, Docetism. We're not going to go into those today, that's not the purpose. But those are three different things that the early church was concerned about. So even though the author of the Bible, or of that particular passage, wasn't supporting uh, Gnosticism, say the Gospel of John, they might say, well, that language could be construed as to be Gnostic in tendency, so maybe we'll change a word so the people in our culture, it's redacted in other words. We got into that last time with the Old Testament, it was redacted. They redacted it and updated it for their contemporary culture so people would not misunderstand it and think that John was trying to communicate a message of Gnosticism. Uh, there are also historical arguments based upon the difference that show up in different manuscripts at the times these heresies were prevalent. So you see these things being adopted in the Bible and these differences are here. I am going to show you an intentional addition to combat Docetism. Docetism, again, is the belief that Jesus did not possess a physical body. This you will find in, are you ready? The King James Version of the Bible. Because they were translating from later Greek texts. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him, and being in agony, he was praying fervently, his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that passage theologically. We all look at that and say, that's fantastic. And it is. But it's clearly a passage that was added after the original. None of the earlier copies of the Greek text have this. And it was written around the time. We only see this appearing around the time that the, the uh, early church was struggling against docetism. And so this very clearly was an addition to the Bible by Christians a couple hundred years after the Bible was written. So it become very clear that Jesus truly was a physical human being and had a body. Nothing wrong with it theologically, just We agree with that. So I don't think it was unfaithful of them to add it. Some people might get excited about 
don't. God guided them, just like God guided the authors of the Bible. I've got no problems with that addition. So let's go on. Most of these errors that occur in the Bible are, are, are pretty easy to discover. Most of them are insignificant and inconsequential, to be frank. Most of them are just like spelling mistakes, or you'll see a word that's spelled incorrectly. That makes sense. Again, Paul did not write primarily in Greek. That was his second or third language. So I'm sure he made ample spelling mistakes when his passages and books were passed on. So we see a lot of spelling mistakes. But for every consequential concern, and there are some consequential concerns. We saw one, the other passage, where the author, where the transmitter of it, skipped a line. It went from the one should to the next should and skipped a whole line that, that uh, it, it just changed the entire meaning of that passage of scripture. For every consequential concern, the good news is there is another passage in the Bible that gives us the appropriate witness to our faith in Jesus Christ. I will tell you that these types of errors appear in every single Greek text. There is not one copy of a Greek text that doesn't have some type of mistake in it. And that's okay. We have ample copies. We can compare them to each other. We can try to decipher which one is close to the original as best as we can. And if we make a mistake, it's okay. I guarantee you we probably have made mistakes. It's okay. Because God, despite our mistakes, still speaks clearly through the scripture. Let's go on. I know, some of you are really mad right now. But let me use a good example. Uh, if you've ever picked up the Gospel of Mark, and this is one that gets King James only folks really, really angry. Don't get angry about this. Get educated. A King James person will open up the Bible and say, Look what those liberals have done. They stopped the Gospel of Mark at first eight without the resurrection. See, they're trying to get rid of the resurrection. They jump to a conclusion. They're proof that they're absolutely ignorant. They don't understand what's going on in the Gospel of Mark. There is a very abrupt ending to the Gospel of Mark that ends in verse 8. The most ancient Greek documents that we have in the Gospel of Mark end in verse 8. What gives? I don't believe that Mark, nobody, not even the most liberal, not even atheistic biblical scholars. By the way, that's not an oxymoron. It's not a contradiction. There are a lot of atheistic biblical scholars. They even read this and say, oh, the gospel can't end on verse 8. But the most ancient Greek documents that we have all end with verse 8. What happened? Well, Mark is the very first gospel that we received. It was probably written on papyrus. Because it was written on papyrus, it became very worn very quickly and maybe... Verse 9 and following, whatever, just got worn, and eventually got worn, worn down. I mean, they we would pass it on to somebody and say, oh, I want to make a copy of the Gospel of Mark. Especially if we believe that Mark was the Gospel that Matthew and Luke used in order to write their Gospels. That's one of the theories. We believe that's probably true. So this Gospel probably got beat around, and eventually this page got lost or at some point, you could no longer read what happened after verse 8. So now all of a sudden, you've got people passing on, they get to verse 8, and they're like, well, I know there's supposed to be a resurrection story here, but it's gone. What are we going to do? The original doesn't exist. So somebody, at some point, decided to add a short ending. And you'll notice that noted in some of your scriptures. So it just kind of gives a hint to it. They said, well, I don't know what Mark read, wrote but we'll add this because obviously we can't have a gospel ending on verse 8 without a resurrection. And then we have what we call the long ending, which almost every single Bible includes. Guess what? I'm very fine with this because I think it's faithful. However, make no mistake, this doesn't exist in the early Greek texts. This is an addition that was added 
long after the Bible was written, because again, they were saying, well, we can't add it. Maybe it was somebody who said, I think I remember how Mark ended that gospel because I wrote it, read it before, so I'll write as, as close to word for word as I can, but I will tell you, if you compare this in Greek, the language of this long ending compared to the rest of the gospel of Mark, it's not even the same style, not the same language. It was clearly written by a separate author. And guess what? <sighs> Take a breath. It's okay. It's okay. It's a faithful witness of the resurrection. I don't care whether you end the Gospel of Mark. If you just want to read the Gospel of Mark, what Mark wrote, then you've got to end with verse 8. That's cool. But understand there probably was a resurrection story. It's not a liberal uh, uh, who came and said, i got to get rid of the resurrection. Well, if a liberal actually came to the Bible and said, I want to get rid of the stories of the resurrection, they did a pretty crummy job because they didn't get rid of it out of Matthew, Luke, or John, did they? <laughs> so you can, you can suffer through with having the Gospel of Mark missing the resurrection story because there are three other Gospel accounts that include the resurrection story. Isn't God Good. But if you look and you say, well, I do want to read this extended edition because traditionally we've read that, that's okay too. Because tradition is also important. We've been passing this ending on in the church for 1,600 years. This has become established in the church as the ending of the Gospel of Mark, and so it is also a faithful reflection. I have no doubt of Mark's intention. It doesn't matter. But if you do want to read the original, you have to end with Mark chapter uh, 16, verse 8. Because this wasn't written by Mark, but this is a faithful witness. And if you do end on verse 8, don't fret. Three other gospel accounts that all have the resurrection story of Jesus Christ. You know, Jerome, Jerome actually, uh, actually did something different. He actually added, he goes to verse 14, and uh, he, he, um, he has that short ending with uh, some additional things. And so there are, there are like five different endings we have the Gospel of Mark. It's all good. Don't fret. God's Word is being faithfully tended to and cared for regardless. It's amazing. So which ending? As I mentioned to you, when we look at this, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. No one, not even an atheistic scholar, as I mentioned, do believe that the original uh, Gospel of Mark ended with women in fear, because that's verse 8. The women were in fear without a resurrection story. That's not how the Gospel ended. We know that. Again, there's no liberal agenda, no satanic agenda, no move afoot. We just lost it. It happens. And like I said, we already have four other gospel accounts with a resurrection story. Three other gospel accounts, as I said to you, was likely damaged because it was originally on papyrus. And those several attempts to recreate an ending, they may be reflective of the original. We don't know. It doesn't matter. None of the long, longer endings are written in Mark's style, as I said to you, but it's okay since we do have three other gospel accounts, each with a resurrection story. It's okay to not have the original ending to the Gospel of Mark. We won't be going to hell because we don't have it. God is faithful. That's another reason why we have three other Gospel accounts. Now, let's go on. I told you we have all thousands and thousands and thousands of different copies of uh, Greek manuscripts, okay? There are three, maybe four, biblical texts, but it's a theory. So we're going to get an address right now, the King James people, the King James only-ism, because they're going to throw out a lot of words that make it seem like they're educated, know what the heck they're talking about, but they're absolutely ignorant. They say, well, the Byzantine texts are the correct texts, and they're the ones that are faithful. The rest are satanic deceptions and blah, 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 blah. They don't realize that they are basing their faith on a theory created by liberal biblical scholars. That's what I find really hilarious about it. They don't realize that the so-called Byzantine text doesn't exist. It's a theory based on the idea that there are certain texts that share certain commonalities 
And so we label them the Alexandrian texts because they share certain commonalities. They don't agree 100% on everything, but they share certain commonalities. And the Byzantine texts share certain commonalities. So there might have been an original text back there. We don't know. We don't have that. We don't, well, we may have the Alexandrian original text. We'll come back to that. But we don't have the original Byzantine text. The Western text, it's, a, it's kind of a mixed text, independent texts that don't seem to share anything in common. They used to be called Caesarean texts. You know, but there, there's, there's just nothing in common between them, so they don't seem like they might have shared a common source. It's called source criticism, and if the King James only people realize that they're basing their belief that the King James is the only version uh, to read on a theory created by liberal scholarship. <laughs> it's hilarious, trust me. We also have other witnesses to the early Bible, the early church fathers. In fact, it was said, tongue in cheek, I'm not sure, or it could be true. I really haven't scouted this out. But it said, if we lost all of these texts, all of the Greek texts, we could actually piece together the New Testament just on the basis of what the early church fathers wrote. And that may be true. I don't know. And then we have translations, other languages. Just like we had a translation of the Hebrew text from Hebrew into Greek, the Greek Septuagint. Remember how important that is to our understanding of the Bible today. We also had other languages. The Bible was translated in other languages very early. Latin, Syriac, Armenian many other different languages and so forth. And these are really rich sources, but none of these texts agree 100%. So again, theory. We theorize there might have been an original that inspired the Alexandrian text. We theorize there might have been a Byzantine text, but we don't know. It's a theory. Okay, I just want to... Um, <laughs> let's... Just kind of an example of this. As I said to you, it's a theory that these texts share a common source, but it's an artificial taxonomy created by scholars to describe biblical manuscripts that share similar characteristics. So if we look at this, is a tomato a fruit or is it a vegetable? And some of you are saying, it's a fruit! It has seeds! But we eat it as though it's a vegetable, don't we? So is it a fruit or a vegetable? Whether fruit, the term, terminology fruit and vegetable, that's an artificial taxonomy. We, it is a fruit according to the definition of a fruit, but we created the definition of fruit. But we treat it and eat it as though it's a vegetable. Is this a fruit? It's a potato. Or a vegetable. Well, what do you think? Put your thinking cap on. It doesn't matter. We treat it like a vegetable, but it's actually a fruit if you go by the appropriate definition. Or how about Pluto? Pluto, there's our friend Pluto. Is it a planet or just a large rock circling the Earth? It depends on how you define what a planet is, isn't it? It's an artificial taxonomy. Planet or not, don't really care. It's still there, okay? Vegetable or fruit, don't really care whether you think it's a fruit, I eat it like it's a vegetable, okay? It doesn't matter. That's true of this. The textual landscape is not binary, it's very complex. And so there's, when we look at the biblical text, the Alexandrian text, the Byzantine text, 90% of the texts agree on just about everything. And so the King James P only people get their tidy whities in a bun over this much. Just to prove that the King James Version is the only version, the authorized version. Just give it a break. Let it go. Take a breath. There is about 2,000 differences in the Bible in between all these Greek texts. Texts, most of them are absolutely insignificant. There are some consequential ones, but guess what? Where there are consequential differences, where the Byzantine texts 
disagree with the Alexandrian text, and the Alexandrian text, if you think it was wrong in this case, guess what? There's still a faithful witness to Jesus Christ, and the very thing that you're upset about, well, there's a faithful witness to the very thing that you're upset about that agrees with you in the Alexandrian text. There's differences in every text type. Not even the Byzantine text types agree with each other. There are massive different disagreements, some significant and some insignificant. Every Greek text, nevertheless, is still a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. Jesus still comes through. Isn't that spectacular? Even when there's disagreements, God is still clearly heard. Oh, please hear this. Even though there may be some significant differences in some cases, God is still clearly heard. One can still be saved, sanctified, and delivered to heaven by whichever Bible or Greek text you may use. God is good. King James onlyism is placing its faith in this book, this translation of the Bible, in the hands of an academic theory. And I think it's just foolish. It's just absolutely foolish. Okay? Let's go on. Let's take a look at each one of these texts. Like I said, this is a theory. So the theory is there are four different, three to four different text types that kind of originated in certain areas and were passed on. So there was an original and this original was copied and copied and copied, and so there's going to be discrepancies between those. And the first one is the Alexandrian text. And if you look at it, in other cases it's called the Egyptian text, in other cases the neutral text, although sometimes that phrase is used of a different type of text. But nevertheless, all of these have been used to this. Alexandrian text is only the word Alexandria because of where we think these texts probably originated from. The grammar and language in these texts tend to be pretty rough in comparison to the Byzantine texts. These texts are more reflective of the ancient fragments that we find. So again, these texts may date to, uh, you know, five, six, a thousand B, uh, AD, but the original, the closer to the original that we get, uh, fragments of texts, 150 B, a, AD, um, they're more reflective of these Alexandrian texts, the rougher type of language. They tend to be shorter. There tend to be passages that are shorter in comparison to many of the Byzantine texts. This is, these are generalizations because, again, it's a theory. And it is true, this is one of the King James only th comments, there is definitely a bias towards these texts in contemporary scholarship. It's true. And the reason for that is because the biblical authors were not Greek speakers as their primary language. So for them to have this fluid, beautiful, flowing Greek language, and I know a lot of Greek, King James only folks are saying, well, they were inspired by the Spirit to write this immaculate Greek. I doubt it. Why does that have to be a, uh, an article of our faith? <laughs> you know, they were inspired to write the Word of God, yes. But to write it in an immaculate Greek you know, I doubt it. If they were rough in their Greek speaking beforehand being inspired, they probably wrote in really rough Greek language. And so the rougher language, shorter text, there is a bias that oftentimes, not always, not exclusively, that in contemporary scholarship we believe these are more reflective of the original autographs. That's a generalization, but it's not 100% true. So when we look at some examples of this, um, we have this thing called the uh, Codex Sinaiticus. And again, this is one that King James only folks will say, see, this is evil. These are evil texts. It is the only codex. The codex, codex by the way, is a style of, of writing. Prior to that, they had written on papyrus, as I told you, and they wrote in capital letters on papyrus. The problem with papyrus is it disintegrates pretty easily. And then we got scrolls. You've seen scrolls and pictures of scrolls. Scrolls are great. It's an improvement and they could be written on different, you know, maybe more ancient form or ancient form of paper and it maybe lasts a little bit longer. But they get worn too. And the other problem with a scroll 
they're harder to negotiate. They tend to be really big and bulky. And so, um, and so a codex is kind of like a contemporary book where you lay things out this way. It's so much easier then to find the page. I just kind of look here, and I just flip here. It's much smaller, easier to negotiate, and to get to the place that you want to get to. So that's what a codex is. So we have this codex, the Sinaiticus. It dates to the fourth century, about 350 AD. It is again the only codex with the New Testament. And notice the date. This is really, in, this is really significant. This, <coughs> This is right after the councils. Remember we talked about this, Council Hippo, Council Carthage, standardized the books of the 27 books of the Bible. So there's a theory that we believe and have strong evidence is true. This may be the Alexandria, this, the Codex Sinaiticus, may be one of the 50 copies that Eusebius was asked to make by Emperor Constantine. You can't get much closer to the originals than that. Okay? So for all those King James only folks that are dismissing the Codex Sinaiticus, this was probably the early church's book. The one, the uh, Codex Sinaiticus. Let's go on. Some other examples of, uh, uh, oh, well, I'm sorry, I've, I've got, oh, this is kind of cool. I'm sorry that didn't come up. Uh, this actually is a copy of the Codex Sinaiticus. There's another copy, um, Codex Vaticanus, another one that the King James only folks are critical of. It dates all the way, oh, that's no good. I'm going to go back to that. There we go. Let's get to that. Uh, the Codex Vaticanus. It is a representation, it is again a representation of what we uh, theorize the Alexandrian text. Again, it's housed in the Vatican, hence its name. That's why a lot of these texts get their names from because of where they are discovered and so forth. Uh, the Codex Vaticanus, one of the things that the King James only folks will do will say, well, they, 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 the, uh, the church was embarrassed by this, so they hid it away in a castle somewhere so nobody could see it. Well, again, it's an ignorance of information. <coughs> That's actually not true. It is actually one of the sources, the Codex Vaticanus is one of the sources that was used in compiling a Greek text by Erasmus, and you're going to hear about Erasmus in a minute. They rejected many of its readings erratic, erratic, uh, erratic wherever they disagreed with the Latin Vulgate. And they also, the Vaticanus also lacks 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and Revelation. It's not because they were excerpted from there because some liberals decided to destroy it. They're just gone. They're missing. They're not deleted. They're just, time just wears on these documents. It's what, it's what happens. Then we have, okay, King James only, folks, the Byzantine text, God's text. Again, their ignorance. These are also called the Lucianic texts, the Antiochian, or the Syrian texts, different names for it. These are biblical texts probably preserved somewhere around Constantinople, or therefore modern-day Istanbul, okay? That was the center of the Greek-speaking world. And, oh, by the way, it is not surprising that Greek was often then smoothed out. These folks would probably look at Paul's writing and say, oh, Paul. That is such rough Greek language. So remember, when they were originally received, they were not received as scripture. They were just books. And so it is very likely that the good Greek-speaking people said, well, I like Paul's book, but I need to smooth out his language a little bit. There are also clarifying harmonizations that have been added to the text that are not in any of the ancient Greek texts. So we know that these are additions not something original to the text. The younger the Byzantine texts get, and remember, there's a range of time of texts that we call Byzantine texts, the greater the differences are between the older ones and the newer ones. So we know that they continue to change these texts as they went along to harmonize them a little bit more with their understanding. Um, what we call the Textus Receptus from which the King James Version, well, it's now become what we call the Greek text from which the King James Version is translated, did primarily consult with Byzantine texts, along with, and this is going to blow your mind, Alexandrian texts, 
and the Latin Vulgate. Ooh, you're going to be shocked by that in just a moment. Let's go on to verse 43. But as I mentioned to you, these texts are not some monolithic whole. There's many discrepancies between every single Byzantine text as well. Uh, there's no translation. <coughs> the King James Version of the Bible, by the way, is not based upon solely the Byzantine texts. It isn't. So again, it just shows and demonstrates the ignorance of King James Onlyism. But let's go on. Um, examples of the Byzantine texts. The Codex Alexandrius. And I do not confuse that with the Alexandrian texts. This is a Codex Alexandrinus. Okay? So that's a difference. It's a codex. This is an actual document. And this is actually a copy of Romans chapter 1. Okay? And the Codex Alexandrinus, which is a Byzantine text. It dates all the way back to the 5th century. Fantastic. Ancient document. Beautiful. So, may, this is the major codex that attests to what we think would be the Byzantine text. And it is also true, as King James only folks will tell you, most minuscules are witnesses to this Byzantine text. That is kind of true. That's why it becomes the majority reading. The majority of Greek texts seem to agree with the Byzantine text, therefore that proves that the Byzantine text is God's version, right? Uh, not exactly. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, minuscule, and you're like, what in the world is that? That's a, that's a really fancy name. A minuscule means rather small. <laughs> and it really refers to how it was written. A minuscule, the uh, uncials, many of the Alexandrian texts are uncial texts, texts, which means they're written in capital letters. The minuscules means that they were writing them in smaller letters, letters in, in, uh, just like we do in English. We'll capitalize the first letter, but not the other letters after, after that. It makes it much easier to write, and quicker to write, and easier to read. So that's one of the reasons why uh, they went to the minuscule form. It's just a brilliant uh, formation of a language. So Byzantine texts are, as I said to you, the majority texts. And the King James Olyism this says, because the majority of Greek texts kind of reflect these Byzantine texts, they are therefore the correct one. That's absolutely, absolutely stupid and absolutely ignorant. I'm going to tell you why. The Byzantine texts developed over time. First of all, there's no agreement between the Byzantine texts. It's not as though it's one monolithic whole. They developed over time. The second thing you need to understand, they're, as, since they're not monolithic, there's evidence that multiple texts over time were redacted and changed and edited. There's another reason why there's many, 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 many more copies of Byzantine texts than what the, the Alexandrian texts. It's owed to the prolific nature of the scholars in Constantinople. Oh, but that's not all. Okay, so take a look at this. Majority agreement is not proof that they are accurate reflection of the original. So if you've got two different copies, and one copy has mistakes in it, but it's copied 50 times, and you've got another copy that's only copied once, does the fact that this one is copied 50 times mean that it's accurate? See, that's what happens. This is the argument of King James only, folks. Well, there's 50 copies of these Byzantine texts, only one of the Alexandrian texts. Therefore, this is correct. But just because you're prolific in copying the exact same text multiple times doesn't prove that this one is better than this one. I mean, it's like having, you know, even in contemporary books, uh, there are versions of books that have typos in it. And so just because the first printing had 5,000 copies, the second printing only had 1,000 copies, and the second printing, of course, they got rid of all the typos. Well, that doesn't mean that the first printing was correct because there were more copies of it. That's stupid. But that's what King James only people argue. There's more copies of the Byzantine text. Therefore, it's the majority reading. Therefore, it's right. No, it just was copied more often. And there's a reason why it was copied more often. Are you ready for this? In 641 AD, the place where the Alexandrian text would have come from was destroyed 
by marauders, the Arab conquest of Alexandria, 641. So you wonder why the Alexandrian texts were no longer copied very much after that. Ah, the Ottoman Emperor, Empire destroyed Constantinople in 1453. They had nearly 800 years, over 800 years, to copy more and more and more texts than the Alexandrians did. Huh, so I wonder why there were more copies. Hmm, just more time. There are more opportunities to copy it. So which text is the original? Doesn't again mean that one is better or more reflective of the original. Which is the original text? And here's going to blow your mind. For King James only, folks, even the reformers didn't believe that the Byzantine texts were the originals. Okay, let me say this again. Not even the reformers believed that the Byzantine texts were an accurate reflection of the autographs. They didn't think they were completely correct. They understood that all of those mistakes in transmission that we talked about, the emendations, had incurred in all of the texts, including the Byzantine texts that they were using to translate their Bibles. A complete Greek New Testament did not exist, so they had to create one. Are you ready? The copy of the Greek text that the King James folks used, the copy of the Greek text that we used, is not a Byzantine text or an Alexandrian text. It isn't reflective of either of those. They're compilations from multiple sources where we hope we try to get as close to the original as we can. But, trust me, King James is not a Byzantine text. Okay? They created a Greek text out of the information that they had. So how do you create a Greek text when one doesn't exist? A complete copy, a good copy doesn't exist. We go on to that page here. There are multiple attempts to do that. Now we're going to get into another historical argument. Here you go again. It's kind of fun. We're going to go through it as quick as we can. Here's what happened. There's this guy named Erasmus in 1516 AD. This is the time of Luther. Oh, by the way, Luther and he could not stand each other. Erasmus um, <laughs> Erasmus was considered to be a liberal, by the way. He was, cons he, he, was, he was a humanist. Not necessarily humanist in the way we use it, but he was uncomfortable with some of the passages of the Scripture, but he did believe that the Scripture had a lot to tell us. So he didn't have access to any of these original or older codexes. But he had seven minuscules, both of the Alexandrian type and the Byzantine type, uh, that he was able to pick up from various places. He said, I'm going to try to compile and make a Greek New Testament out of these seven texts. The problem was, he didn't have the entire Greek text, even between those seven minuscules. In fact, he was completely missing the book of Revelation. So what did he use when he didn't have Greek witnesses to the text? He used the Latin Vulgate. He would back-translate it. He would take the Latin Vulgate by Jerome, he would translate the Latin into Greek, and then he would treat, translate the Greek, or then he would transpose the Greek and put it into his text. So that's what he did. So that's how he created a Greek text. Luther, Martin Luther used one of, even though he hated Erasmus, that was the only thing he could use to create his German Bible. Tyndale, you remember Tyndale, he created the uh, first... Uh, um, English translation, and Tyndale also used Erasmus' text, but it was a first attempt. Nobody would use Erasmus' text today. So there's another guy named Estian, a.k.a. Stephanus, and this is an actual copy of the Greek text that Stephanus came up with. He started with Erasmus' attempt as a starting point, and he started putting various readings and passages in the scripture to show that there were differences between many of the copies of the Greek text. He wanted to make sure that you're aware he was making certain choices. And so this was a much better attempt, but it wasn't the finalized attempt. We got to another guy, Theodore Beza. We're getting to King James in a minute. Just hang tight, because this all leads up to King James. There's a guy named Theodore Beza, 1565, who did a third attempt. 1516, 1550, 1565. He took Stephanus' Greek text, Estian's, 
and he used that as a starting point. Remember, seven minuscules, Alexander and Byzantine types that were used in this and this and this up to here. He started, and this is an actual copy of his. You notice, it's even, there's even more notes in this, right? Look at that, how fantastic that is. He made a critical evaluation of decisions that Stephanus made. He agreed with some of them, he disagreed with others. He added verses in the Bible where there were no witnesses in the primary Greek sources. Where do you think he got that from? Oh, the Latin Vulgate. Because it seems that the early church, or not the early church fathers, reformers, trusted the Latin Vulgate more than they did the Greek text that they had. So again, all these King James only folks who said, the Byzantine text, the Byzantine text, the reformers did not trust the Byzantine texts. They trusted the Latin Vulgate more than they did the Byzantine texts. And so you often see passages added or changed because they're directly translated from the Latin Vulgate, not from any Greek text that they had. Because again, I can't stress this enough, they did not trust the Greek text that they had. They knew they were not accurate reflections of the handiwork of Paul, or Peter, or Matthew, or Mark. Oh, now we get to King James. All right, King James folks, you're ready. Get your head blown. You're going to be so mad at me right now. Again, I have no disrespect for the King James. None. Zero. I have such admiration for the King James Committee and what work they did. It was fabulous. It's a book that has been read for 400 years. I have admiration for what they did. The King James Version took Beza's attempt at creating a Greek text and then they added to it. They created their own composite of Greek text. Again, they relied heavily upon Beza's Greek text, but there are a lot of passages they didn't like in Beza. And they kept flipping back to the Latin Vulgate and said, well, see, it doesn't contain certain passages that the Latin Vulgate does. We like the Latin Vulgate more than we do the Greek texts, than the Byzantine texts, than the Alexandrian texts. And so when there were discrepancies, they relied very heavily on the Latin Vulgate. Okay, this is where I want King James only folks, their heads to be blown. Okay? Because they're going to be so mad at this. Most King James only people hate Roman Catholics. I don't know why. They're bigots. Okay? They're religious bigots. They're scribes. They're Pharisees. Um, I happen to love the Roman Catholics. We wouldn't have our faith in the condition of the way it is today. I'm a Lutheran, but we wouldn't be Christians today were it not for those faithful, godly Roman Catholics. Thank God for them. I know a lot of you are turning me off right now. That's okay. But here's going to blow the mind of some King James only folks. They hate Roman Catholics, and yet... So many of the discrepancies between contemporary translations and the King James Version of the Bible are the result of the fact that they relied on the Latin Vulgate, the Catholic form of the Bible. Ooh, head blown, King James only people. You should, if you really hate Roman Catholics as much as you say you do, you should take the King James 1611 King James Version of the Bible and throw it in the toilet. If you really hate Roman Catholics, because it relied very heavily on the Latin Vulgate. And there are many times, many passages in the Latin Vulgate that don't exist in any Greek text that they put into their translation of the Bible. I am going to show you some. How do we know this? By the way, I'm not making this up. We know exactly which Greek texts the King James folks were using, and we know for a fact they told us that they're also consulting the Latin Vulgate. And when you compare the Greek texts that they were using, and the Latin Vulgate, you will notice there are massive discrepancies between it in some cases, and they almost always chose the Latin Vulgate over the Byzantine texts that our King James only folks love so much, but are absolutely ignorant about the truth. Okay, so let's. I got people mad right now. I, mean, I just know it. Let's go on to the next one.
Come on. It's, it's, oh, there you go. Examples, I, this is what I wanted to put on. An example of an addition to the King James Version of the Bible that is not in any Greek text. Any Greek text. You can look at all of the Greek texts that exist. You will never find this passage of Scripture. The only place you're going to find it is in the Latin Vulgate. This is just evidence number one. This is not, it's one of many examples. The white is what the Greek text says. The red is what the Latin Vulgate adds. And therefore what the King James Version added. So again, I know King James folks are saying, look at all these things these liberal Christians took away from the Bible. No, it's just the opposite. Look at all these things the King James Version added to the Bible that aren't in any Greek texts. This is what the Bible actually says. For there are three that bear record, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. First John. This is only found in the Latin Vulgate. In, for there are three, three that bear record. In heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in earth. It was probably an addition that was added in the Latin Vulgate to combat some uh, form of heretical doctrine. But it isn't in any Greek text. So for King James folks who want to say, well, this is the most accurate version of the Bible, no, it's not. It's basically the Latin Vulgate warmed over. That's all the King James is. It's a great translation. I have a great joke. Jesus is still witnessed to accurately. You can read this with the addition that the King James Version has or without it, and you can still come to a relationship with Christ. So unlike the King James folks, I'm not going to say, you're going to hell if you read the King James. No, you're not. But I would tell you, it's not as accurate a translation as more to the contemporary ones because of all the additions of the King James Version of the Bible. We're going to come back and look at some other ones. Like I said, this is kind of ironic considering the fact that they are so uh, sold on being uh, the original document and they're just not. So let's compare. Let's, let's compare this. This is actually, um, in case people didn't believe me, um, this is, uh, this is the United Bible Study Greek text. This is Nestle Alan. They're all based upon all of the Greek texts, a compilation of, of all the Greek texts. And you'll notice, if you can read Greek, you'll notice you get to, uh, you know, to verse 7, and then uh, through verse 8, those things in red are not there. Because, again, they don't exist in the Greek texts only in the Latin Vulgate. Uh, this is, there was a scholar who actually studied um, the King James Version of the Bible back in the uh, 19th century. And after studying it, he realized that he, he made a statement in his book. And this is a guy who, by the way, respected the King James Version. He's, he's not a critic of it. He said, in some places, the authorized version, <clears throat> King James Version, uh, corresponds only loosely with any form of the Greek original while it exactly follows the Latin Vulgate. How do we know this? Again, because we've looked at the Greek text that the King James Version was using and the Latin Vulgate, and there are so many passages that don't exist in any Greek text, only in the Latin Vulgate, and those things ended up in the King James Version of the Bible. So let's go on. So contemporary Greek texts. You can tell right now that I'm a big advocate of the more contemporary Greek texts that we have, the United Bible Society, the Nestle Alon text. These are much better and closer to the original. I will tell you why in a bit. But, so we, we already went through how there were some more, the reformers tried to create a composite of Greek text, you know, from, uh, um, from Erasmus to Stephanus to Beza, the King James Committee, and I think they were all good starts. But we continued that process as we discovered more and more texts and Greek texts and started understanding these a little bit better. And so you, I'll just go through this as quickly as we can. I apologize. It seems like we have a, uh, a uh, white spot blocking out some of our screen, and I see no way to block that. 
So uh, we'll just do th go through this the best that we can. Tischendorf, Westcott, Hort, and Weymouth, they were in the 19th century. They found more copies of the Greek text. They were unearthed in 18th, 19th centuries. Whole books and fragments of books of the Bible, copies of codex, uncials, and minuscules. And uh, so they developed what they call this transmission theory. So this transmission theory that there's a Byzantine text and the Alexandrian text owes everything to these guys, okay? They're the ones that created this. Oh, and it's, it's again, this is the theory, it's how twisted it is, the theory that the King James folks hang your hat on. They would very much disagree with them in any other camp example and say, these are heretics and these are liberals, but yet the King James only folks base their entire belief on the King James Version of the Bible on these guys, and they don't even know it, okay? These are the ones that developed the transmission theory of the Bible. And they are the ones who rediscovered the Codex Sinaiticus. It's not like it didn't exist, okay? It, it's just that it wasn't available to the reformers. And they probably would have been very glad to have had it, had they had it. They compared the composite Greek text by the reformers with the new discoveries that they made, and they developed a methodology of deciphering a more faithful Greek text to the original. Now, I will confess that even contemporary scholarship believes that they are too reflexive. They had a too reflexive uh, acceptance of Alexandrian texts. They just, oh, it's Alexandrian, therefore we're going to accept those. And I think that's foolish too. Most contemporary scholars believe that we need to look at the whole package, every text and come to an evaluation of what's closest to the original and not just have a bias towards one or the other. But they certainly had a very reflective acceptance of Alexandrian texts. At this time, there's another guy named Eberhard Nestle uh, who made use of those composite texts that were done before him and the cornucopia of uh, Greek manuscripts. And he started compiling his own. His son Calvin took it over and they created what's called the Novum Testamentum this is now in its 28th edition. They continue to add to it as we learn more and more about Greek, as we gain more understanding of these texts, and uh, this is honestly the one I use. But there's also another one. Uh, it's basically the same text. It's not basically. It is the same text now. Uh, the United Bible Society. It was, and the reason why the uh, United Bible Society and the Nestle Alon text are the exact same Greek text today is because of this guy, Kurt Alon. Kurt Alon became the, the linchpin between these two texts, the United Bible Society version and, uh, and, the, um, and the Nestle Alon version. They're both identically, basically identical. Uh, but so why would we have two different Greek texts that are basically identical? And that's simply because one is made for scholars one is made for translators. Both need different tools, and so that's basically the difference uh, between those texts. All right, so let's go on. So, what is my bias about this? I, I've obviously pretty heavy-handed here. I've indicated to you that I believe that the uh, that the Nestle Alon, the United Bible Society Greek texts are much closer to the originals than the Textus Receptus, which is what was used by the King James Version of folks and is still used to this day in translating the King James Version of the Bible. I think that's just, a, it's, it's not as accurate. However, I believe that a person could become a Christian from reading the King James Version of the Bible. I believe that it is a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. Because after all, that is what the Bible is. It is a witness to Jesus Christ, but it is not the object of my faith. This is what concerns me and distresses me about King James only, folks. They've made acceptance of the translation of the King James Version of the Bible part and parcel to their faith in Jesus Christ. If you don't believe that this is the only authorized version by God, you're going to hell. That's what a King James only person will tell you. They've made acceptance of a translation of the Bible part and parcel to their faith. That's astonishing and so unbiblical and so un-Jesus and so ungrace-like. They are the contemporary scribes and Pharisees. Okay? I don't, I'm not here telling you that you have to accept. If you want to use the text, uh, Bibles translated from the Texas Receptus, which is the one, again, based uh, that the King James Race is on, 
I'm fine with that. I'm okay with that. If you want to argue that's a more accurate reflection of the, the, uh, the New Testament that was written by, uh, uh, by the original authors, I'm fine with that. It's okay. Because you're going to get an accurate witness to Jesus Christ. Even though there's going to be discrepancies between the one I read and you read, you're still going to get an accurate re uh, reflection of Jesus Christ, a witness to him. And the same thing is true with the version that I'm reading. It's still an accurate reflection of Jesus Christ. There's no translation. In fact, there's no Greek text that deserves my absolute devotion. Only Jesus Christ does. I believe that God can speak to us regardless of the Bible you are reading today, as long as there was a great deal of care, thought, and prayer put into it. And I believe that's true of the Kurt Alad, the United Bible Society Greek text. I think it's true of the Textus Receptus. I think it's true of the King James translation of the Bible. I think it's true of the Revised Standard Version or whatever contemporary English translation you may be reading. God is still foot and at work. And they are faithful witnesses to Jesus Christ. So my bias. I'm convinced, as I said to you, that the Novum Testament Grece, the Nestle Allah in Greek text, is a more faithful rendition of the Greek text, closer to the original, to the autographs, than the Textus Receptus used by the King James Version. I think that's a much poorer copy of the Greek. But it's okay if you disagree. I believe it's better because it has a more accountable methodology. The authorized version, the folks who want you to accept the King James as the only accurate translation and best, the only English translation you should use, are asking you to put your faith in a translation of a book that is a living and breathing book through whom God speaks to us. Why would I do that? I don't believe in the King James Version of the Bible. I believe in Jesus Christ. I don't even believe in the Bible. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe the Bible is a witness to Jesus Christ. And God speaks to me through it. But I don't idolize the Bible and I don't worship the Bible. I believe in Jesus. And I do believe that the Bible is a witness to Christ, not the object of my faith. And so I believe that Jesus comes to me whether it's the Novum uh, Testamentum Grece, the United Bible Society Greek text, the Texas Receptus, God can clearly be heard. Next time when we get together, we're going to take a look at translations. And there's a whole lot of differences between translations. We're going to talk about why. And I hope that will inspire you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for this opportunity to gather here today and talk about your holy word. You speak to us still very clearly to this day. We just give you thanks. Forgive us when we just get so fixated on a particular translation of the Bible as though this is the only way your word can be heard. It's a translation. And you continue to work with us. And you continue to guide us still to this day. And we just give you thanks for that. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.